<clears throat> Welcome back to another episode of Stalk Talks. I'm Zoe. And I'm Tom. And I'm Wendy. Kings- oh. Hey, Wendy. King's Day is almost upon us. Uh, It's one of the largest, most exuberantly celebrated holidays on the Dutch calendar. Here at Stork Talks, we decided to dig a little deeper into the history of this Dutcher than Dutch day and to also take a small detour on the way. Absolutely. King's Day is a special day for the Netherlands. I think it's unlikely that one will ever see a greater collection of orange-clad folks all in one place than on King's Day. We also love to play all sorts of hilarious, silly games and return to our roots by becoming pavement shopkeepers for the day. But I think King's Day is about more than these outward signs of frolics and fun. The Netherlands has only had a monarch for a relatively short term compared to other European nations like the UK and Spain. Well, exactly, Tom. So this is fascinating to me because the name suggests a celebration of the monarchy, and yet the Netherlands was a republic for a long, long time beforehand. And it was also during this time, of course, that we have the Dutch Golden Age. So with this in mind, we invited art historian of Casa del Arte, Wendy Fossen, to tell us a little bit about a female portrait painter who captured three generations of the Dutch royal family on canvas and was celebrated by the Uffizi Gallery in Italy, Teresa Svazza. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Zoe and Tom. Glad to be here. It's, it's an absolute delight to have you back. And we're happy because on top of being a Dutch person that celebrates King's Day, you we are, of course, are the art historian that's going to be with us for our little detour. Um, perhaps you can start, Wendy, by filling our audience in on a little of the history and the origins of King's Day which was previously known as Queen's Day and even Prinsessendag. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, it's a very long history. And um, as you already said in your introduction, it's the day that we celebrate our monarch and that could either be a queen or a king, hence Queen's Day or King's Day. And um, what we then do is we have all these local festivities, as you already explained, we, we, it will be lying out our our leftover toys and clothes that we don't want to wear anymore on the free market and those are all the 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 local activities but we also have this nationwide activity where um each year and another dutch city is celebrate is is asked to host the celebrations and um then the royal family joins in in all these silly games uh and it's the entire family i mean it's like not only the king and the queen and their daughters, but like their cousins and, and aunts and uncles and whoever feels like joining. So it's a very um, low uh, profile, well, it's a high profile thing, but it's a very um, informal thing. So you can you can touch them if you want. And if you get the opportunity, then. Uh, because where are they, do they move around to these different cities? So they are sort well, of. How does it work exactly? No, it's it's just one city this year. It's Eindhoven, mm. Uh, mm. and uh, each year there it's a different city, and they host yeah. these celebrations. And then in it's it's like you know the uh, when when Sinterklaas arrives in the country that that is also hosted by uh, an, a different city each year, um, and. Um, it's like you know it's 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 a great way as a city to expose yourself nationally um to show um you know what your main business is your uh, your in what things you excel uh, and of course it, it gives you the 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 chance to for your population for the inhabitants of the city um to show their hobbies, their, you know, you have gymnastic stuff, dance stuff, music stuff. So it's all, of course, it's, you know, it's not high, high level, but it's, it's so much fun. Where does the, where do the king and queen fit in? I mean, do they visit that city and then do they join in just randomly join in festivities there or how no, exactly does that there's happen? There's like a, a, of course it's it's highly uh, uh, high security so it mm. they, there is this route that they walk through the city and it's all oh, okay. it's, it's really really carefully planned thing. yeah okay okay so it's not like a spontaneous thing okay let's go this way let's go that way no, no they, they uh, just <laughs> follow the route <laughs> <laughs> but still, you might you know, just bump I mean, into them and having a beer. Who, who knows? Yeah, having a beer. Exactly. But you know, it's it's 
uh, it's something, as, as Tom already said, it's something which is incomparable to other countries um, and to other monarchies. I mean, can you imagine uh, Queen Elizabeth or Prince Charles walking around no. you know, without highly, highly security, um, you know, in, in whatever town? So no, I, I think it's fair to say it's more informal here in the, in the Netherlands. Exactly, exactly. And, and considering, you know, the history, because Tom also said uh, Princessedach and Queen's Day. Um, well, of course, we now have a king, so hence it will be uh, King's Day. But um, since 1948, so, um, you know, more than my life, I mean, I'm from 68. So, you know, it's like forever. Um, it has been on the 30th of April. And uh, since we had queens at the time, so Queen Juliana and Queen Beatrice, um, it was always Queen's Day. So it took a while for people to get used to the, the King's Day thing. Uh, and also uh, it was very annoying because it only moved three days uh, because it's celebrating the birthday of the monarch. So um, Alexander, William Alexander's birthday is on the 27th of April and his grandmother's was on the 30th of April. So when she became queen in 1948, um, it moves from the 25th of August, which was her mother's birthday, to uh, the 30th of April. But still, you know, very a good time, relatively okay with the weather. Um, but when Beatrice became yeah. queen became queen in 1980, she has her birthday on the 31st of January. So no way that you can have all these festivities outdoors. So she decided to stick with her mother's birthday. So that's why we have two generations of queens having their kind of birthday on the 30th of April but Willem Alexander has his birthday on the 27th so he just said okay we'll make it Queen's Day or King's Day and we're going to move it three days which was a silly thing I think but anyway right I mean yeah that was I, I thought that it was going to stay on that one day Wasn't yeah that that's what, we what I thought discussing? and hoped yeah I think the, the best part is that if it sometimes if it falls on a Sunday, we also move it to the Saturday because Sunday. So so basically, it doesn't really matter whether it's the exact birthday as long as we can move it to a day that is suitable for us and to yeah. celebrate it basically. Yeah. yeah, to have a party. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. That's true. So I kind of hoped it remained, but it's also fun because you know there's plenty of people who have their birthday, their own birthday, on the thirtieth of April, uh, and they they always had the day off, and now a whole new. Um, um, a whole new generation of people can have their birthday on 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 a on a day off. Well, so, that's, you know. yeah, maybe that's a little more democratic. Now, yeah, maybe. now maybe we can move on a little bit. Uh, you are an art historian, and of course, you're familiar um, with the work of a 19th century Dutch painter, Teresa Svatza. Now, she was an extremely successful portrait painter who ran a very lucrative family business in Amsterdam. Yeah, and indeed. Became so famous that the Uffizi Gallery in, in Italy commissioned a self-portrait of her, and I think you will show that to us in a, in a minute. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's interesting about her is she also painted portraits of the royal family, and we with perhaps you can tell us what can we credit her success to, given the fact that women in these days seldom had the opportunity to train and work as professional artists. Well, I think the most important thing is that she came from a uh, artistic family. I mean, her father, George, uh, young George Schwarze, was a painter. And uh, also her sister, um, she wasn't a painter, but she was a um, sculptor. Um, and also her niece, the, the daughter of her sister, uh, became a very famous painter, Lizzie Anzing. So we have Therese Schwarze, Georgina Schwarze and Lizzie Anzing, both from the same family, basically, um, who became very, very famous and very successful. And all of them were women. And um, that largely has to do with the fact that they came from an artistic family. So yeah, it's 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 basically that, and that made it possible for her to become famous. Also, she was she was talented, of course. Otherwise, you know, you know, if when you're a crappy painter, then you can 
and be from a, an artistic family, but then you wouldn't be successful. But she was really, really good. She was, when she was 15, she had her first commissions already for uh, portraits of like famous Amsterdam families, the Van Loans, for instance. And she would continue painting them for a number of years. Uh, 15 members of four generations of Van Loon family was, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, painted as a, 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 with their portraits. And when her so, father died, she took over the business, the family business. So, I believe so. I mean, but now perhaps particularly we could just focus a bit on her because we're speaking, of course, about King's Day and Queen's Day. Uh, focus on her work for the for the royal family because I believe this is also, of course, something that must have helped her gain a lot of recognition. Yeah, it, it did. Um, and, and if you permit me, I'll share my screen and show you some uh, some images of Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I, I brought this one with me just to give you an idea what what kind of style she painted. I mean, we're talking about this is early 20th century. And for those of you who know a bit about their arts, we're in already in a period which we call uh, expressionism, if you want to talk about avant-garde art. Uh, so this is entirely like old fashioned, uh, but this is the kind of stuff that you want yourself uh, um, be portrayed in. I mean, this is an absolutely gorgeous portrait of this uh, mother with her five children. Uh, and obviously uh, these people were very um, fortunate, uh, both financially and um, um, emotionally in the sense that they could have themselves uh, portrayed by Therese Schweitzer. Um, the um, painting that you talked sorry, about. Sorry. Uh, what, what which, quick, maybe yeah. quick for people who are listening and who don't have the view, like what are some of the things that they can, well, basically what can you tell them what they can see and what they, for people who are listening to the podcast? Yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, the group portrait that I showed is, uh, um, is painted in like an impressionist style. So it's very uh, pas beautiful pastel colors. You see an, an excellent expression of, of, of texture and, and fabrics. It's absolutely wonderful. So it's all in blue hues. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's like a, a very pretty uh, painting. Um, is that enough for a description? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think let's yeah, okay. yeah let, and let's focus on the on the self portrait and maybe a little yeah. of the portraits of the king and queen. Yeah, um, the the self portrait that you see here is that what she made for the, for the Uffizi, um, and it, it was something which was very basically extraordinary um, because she um, she then is joining all the great masters of before um, by being in the Uffizi and she's the only Dutch woman who has been asked actually to um, paint herself for the Uffizi. So that indicates how incredibly famous and mm. um, um, yeah, what a great portraitist she, uh, she was. Uh, talking about the portrait that she made for the um, for the royal family is what you see um, here um, and um, it is something that is like in in a um oh if i want to describe the self-portrait is standing lady looking uh covering her eyes looking at a, a mirror and then um you know painting herself basically uh, the group yeah. portrait of the royal family is a group portrait of um the the um the, the, the family, which is um, the young queen, um, Wilhelmina. Um, and um, it's with Prince Hendrik, her um, husband. I'm just figuring. Yeah, it's Wilhelmina and Hendrik and Juliana. So Juliana is the okay. queen that became queen in 1948. And Wilhelmina uh, and her husband are, are dressed here in 17th century clothes and they're depicted in front of this huge fireplace um, with a, a large painting in the back uh, depicting a, a, a warship, I think it is, with the Dutch flag. Um, and there's also a little um, Dash Hound, I think you call it in English. Yes, um, yes. Which is probably uh, one of their pets. Um, so it, it very much looks as if this is a 17th century portrait, um, but it isn't, but it's in 17th century style. And you can find it in, um, usually it is um, uh, on display in Palais at Lowe, uh, and it's part of the royal collections. Um, and this is something that was extraordinary. Why, Wendy, because, sorry, Wendy, why would they have chosen to be painted in the 17th century style if that was um, in fact? 
not the because time that they were living. They probably wanted to step in the footsteps of uh, other uh, famous, um, in this case, stadtholders in the 17th century, uh, right. Frederick Hendrik and Amalia von Zomt, who were like the first stadthouders who actually made a step on the social ladder by, you know, uh, marrying off their children to uh, royalty. I mean, their, their son, William II, married Mary Stuart I, and their son, William III, married Mary Stuart II. So from then on, from Frederick Hendrik and Amalia von Solms, from then on, they were part of, say, the royal families in, in Europe. And as, as you said, we're only a monarchy for about 200 years now. So it was like a, a huge step when we got mm. the possibility as, as part of geopolitics to become a monarchy in, in 1813. So, yeah, they wanted to show kind of step in the footsteps because you also said that before um, our monarchy started in 1813, uh, we had the, the, the golden age. But that was basically in the 18th century, we were kind of um, over shadowed by um, the Brits and the French. So it was mainly the 17th century uh, that was the golden age for the, the Dutch golden age. Mm -hmm. And of course, golden, not for everybody. Mind you, uh, that's one of the things that we have to point out all the time. It was a golden age in terms of art. And Absolutely. it wasn't uh, uh, as, uh, as nice for everybody. I, I was going to say thank you, Wendy, because I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid we might get a little lost in the topic because there's so much to talk about and so much history. I think exactly. what, what I'd recommend to the, the listeners as well is um, we, we're trying to give a little description of the paintings, but feel free to check out the, the YouTubes where you'll find the full paintings with the presentations, which might add a little bit of extra depth to uh, to, to what you're seeing right here. Um, one other question as a, a final sort of step in our detour, Wendy, was that um, there is a wider group of Dutch female artists like Theresia Swart right now who are finally getting recognition for their contribution in arts. So could you briefly tell us about, well, the, the specific development we see in, in the arts in the arts world, Wendy? Yeah, I, I brought a photo to illustrate that as well. Um, I mean, until 1850, what you see here is a group picture of women in a workshop um, where you see also nude statues of nude men. Uh, and that was basically the thing that until 1850, kind of people, uh, women were not allowed to join uh, academies. So um, they were not allowed to, to draw and study the male nude. So that was basically something that was, you know, when you want to paint a person, you need to know about their anatomy. And nudity was something that you had to shield women from uh, as much as possible. So that was one of the things that uh, made it difficult for women to join uh, um, academies. And it, basically it was forbidden. And of course, when you, you were lucky, if you would come from, a, if you came from a family of, of artists like Therese Schwarze, and also in the 17th century and the centuries before that, it was extremely difficult for women uh, to join um, uh, or to become an artist full stop. So, yeah. I mean, were the, well, I, I don't know, were the nude models always men? Did they not have nude female models, which then aspiring female painters might have been able to paint, or was it not not as it was nudity in it was nudity in general that was okay. Um, okay. you know not not acceptable. Although of course there there have there have always been women who you know thought up yours. I'm just gonna do whatever I like. It's so it is. Uh, yeah, and 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 thank God they did because then mm. otherwise we would not have all these great female painters in 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 history. And we do. Um, they're not that many, and um, there were more than we ever have known, uh, and mm. they were famous in their days as well. So this just just to to finish this bit off, then Wendy, I believe that this part of this recognition that they're gaining is this uh, sort of a role of honor or being added to this uh, role of honor in the Rijks Museum. Exactly, is, is that exactly. The case? Yeah, there's there's three women, three female painters um, that um, have been added to the the gallery of honors, which was basically always uh, reserved for the men. Uh, but Judith Leister and Gisina Ter Borg and Rachel Ruis uh, now have found their permanent place there which is you know it makes sense i mean it's not that they, they want to oust the men it's that 
the women deserve a place next to them because they were extremely, I mean, uh, talk about Rachel Rausch, it's, it's very similar to um, uh, Therese Schwarzer. She was incredibly famous and people paid huge amount mm. for her works in her own days. Okay, so I mean, maybe we can this we have already touched on the, the issue of the Golden Age um, for the for the Netherlands, but it does seem well, perhaps you, as an art historian, perhaps you can explain a little more to us about how this Golden Age took place before the monarchy is do you think there is something in that it seems uh, something of a paradox, but uh, this, uh, this is quite an interesting to me it's quite an interesting historical phenomenon. Uh, that the, the monarchy only came in later and this golden age happened quite a little bit beforehand. Yeah, well, um, it, it's, it's all, you know, it's, 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 to, to explain that in just a few words is very difficult because it's all about, you know, European politics. It all starts with the fact that the, 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 the Spanish Empire is overtaking uh, the Netherlands and that the Netherlands become um, increasingly, uh, you know, independent and William of Orange then decides to take up the, the Spanish in a revolution and that results in the 80 years war which is like raving all over Europe and um, in, in the, for the Netherlands, Netherlands specifically it's, it's quite curious that you during this period of 80 years war you also have this golden age so it's kind of a, a, a contrast um, and it, it can only be explained by the fact that, you know, the, the Dutch have always been merchants and travelers. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we speak English and the rest of the world doesn't speak Dutch. I mean, that's one of the things that, that is, is a result of that. Um, and the, the wealth of the Dutch, it all began with, with trading in the late 16th century of, of cheese and 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 milk you know that's basically what was traded at, at the beginning and then they started uh, trading with uh, Scandinavia uh, for for all, all kinds of other products and it wasn't until uh, I think it, 1604 that the um, Dutch East Indies Company was, was founded and then 1621 the, the West Indies Company was founded and then mm. they started trading all over the world basically uh, at the expense of the Spanish and the Portuguese so that's why you get all these wars so you know and of course the French and the English were very upset about it and wanted to get part of their trade so you know it's, it's really difficult to explain in a few and so words. it and so it goes and so it goes all right yeah. I was gonna say it, it, I think like um the, the pleasure with which you talk history is is, some, is <laughs> unprecedented to some extent. Um, um, what I like is because, of course, we, this episode is about King's Day. And when we speak about the monarch, and you just explained a little bit of where it came from, where it originated from. But I, I think one topic that we are we also wanted to talk about is more of a future perspective. So we have recently witnessed the passing, of course, of Prince Philip in the UK, yeah. husband of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and many see this as an, an, yeah, the end of an era of the British monarchy. So the question that we had was, uh, do you think that the Dutch monarchy will continue to enjoy the, the Dutch support of the public or uh, will, that, will that change in the future? No, I think I think the support will remain. I mean, they still have a function. Of course, there are many people who are more Republican than than um, fans of the monarchy. Um, but as long as they don't do anything really stupid, I think people will kind of condone them and say, OK, well, you know, it's it's like a PR means, basically, mm -hmm. because, you know, you go to other countries and you meet other uh, royalty and then in their wake you see all these um uh, commercial activities and it's just you know paving the way for all these um, this all, yeah you know business basically so from a business point of view i would say you know keep the monarchy because you know it's it's like a a good thing and you know i'm i'm kind of a fan of the of the orange family even though you know there is also doubt about whether they're actually real um but that's an entirely different discussion. That seems like a very interesting cliffhanger. Uh, well, um, when um, I don't know where exactly it happened, but you, you know that um, they've been trying to figure out uh, whether the bones that they found in Russia are actually of the royal family and you need DNA from 
members of the royal families across Europe uh, to figure out, you know, who's who. The um, William II, King William II, was married to Anna Pavlona, who was of royal descent. So basically, that, that DNA you would have to find in our current monarchs. But they have refused to donate DNA. Why, why do you think that is, Wendy? Do they have something to hide? Well, that's something that, you know, sometimes you want to get to the bottom of things because you want to find out the why and how. Uh, but in this case, I think people just kind of know in the background that maybe somewhere along the line, um, children were the royal family members, but, you know, uh, but all a little hazy. <laughs> yeah. But do we want to know? Does it well, it's a, fan it's a fantasy, really, isn't it? Right. That's the whole, the whole thing. thing is kind of a fantasy exactly. thing. Yeah, exactly. And as I said, as long as they're, they're not doing anything really, really stupid, then it's fine by me. I don't really need to know. I'm curious whether a lot of other listeners or, or people who, who sort of feel the same way about their monarch is the Dutch, like a very a sort of sober perspective to say, well, as long as they bring in money, then we're fine. You know, they, they can coexist. And as long as they bring in more than they cost, you know, then, then we're happy for them to continue. That's but yeah. I think I think the the UK has had this discussion as well, and I think there though there are people in the UK who are who would like to see the end of the monarchy, and their argument is that yes, they do bring in money, but they also spend and own an incredible, eye-watering amount of property. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is the case in the UK, but I I suspect that this is not the same for the Dutch monarchy. Um. Well, they, they, of course, they have like all these palaces and huge collections, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, very much informed about the whole financial side of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, they do get an, a state allowance for the things that they do state wise, um, but, but they do own a lot of stuff, of course. But then again, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a whole economy around it as well. I mean, uh, looking again at the at the British monarchy. I mean, if you if you just abolish them and you know say, okay, you here you have a bag full of money and you hand over uh, all your property and all your art. I mean, this, you can just talk about the art collection that they own. It's like amazing. And um, the jewels. But, you know, it's. <laughs> One of the one of the souvenirs that you buy when you go to London is this little Elizabeth with sh her shaking head or something like that, or a mug or whatever. I mean, True. that would cave in entirely when you well, when you abolish the monarchy. So perhaps it would be filled by by something else. Perhaps there would be become indeed. like would different bobbing heads or different stamps. Boris Johnson. And, I, I'm not sure if it would be Boris maybe, maybe, yeah, may, or maybe there'd be a. Re I think I, to be fair, I don't think they're ever going to abolish it, but I think to reduce it, maybe I, I do think in the well, as again, I think I see them in Spain and the and and the Netherlands, we see the monarchy as a bit more modest and yeah. more in keeping with modern times, but in the UK, they still it's it's extreme, and and I think that's where quite a lot of people yeah. feel. Well, much. probably ha that also has to do with the fact that there are a lot, there are still a lot of nobility. I mean, nobility mm. is is something that we we never really had. Mm. Um, of course, th th there have been already, you know, in the 17th century, you had a number of of, of nobles, um, but um, it's it's not like in the UK. So I think that's one of the differences as well. I mean, we we came short of nobles, so that's why some of them were created in the 19th century as well and the, and the 18th century so yeah all right well i think we've we've discussed that in some depth but i i'd like us to bring us back our, our focus onto king's day itself uh, so perhaps we can finish off uh, and this is for both wendy and tom as uh, as bona fide dutch uh, dutch nationals uh, to ask you both how how are you going to celebrate King's Day and uh, what does it mean to you? So perhaps maybe Tom, we can start with you if you're more from the younger generation and then we'll hear from Wendy who's a little bit from an older generation. I'm just interested to hear if there's a, a generational difference in perspective. 
Yeah, so it's it's a very two sided question. So let's say what what am I doing for for King's Day this year? Um, I was in contact with a friend of mine who does some work at the Royal Palace, and she told me about uh, the the streamers concept, uh, streamers uh, uh, well event that is happening. Unfortunately, because with the current situation, everything is still online. So I will be enjoying some of the music and some of the festivities online, but simultaneously, I hope to be out and about here in the Hague and and see if there are still some flea markets, some socially distanced flea markets that are out and about. Um, but what King's Day means to me, and, and my, perhaps my favorite experiences from King's Day come from uh, my hometown, uh, Duisburg, a very small town where we would have, uh, well, where I would stand at the flea markets and try to sell everything by the end of the day and then use that money to play games that would also be set up around the town. So there would be games where you've had to try and whistle after eating a number of very, like the, the tea biscuits that dry your mouth out, which Basically, you could never win that game or there would be some games where you had to put in a little candy into a tube, which was um, uh, uh, non-transparent or you couldn't see through it. So what happens is it comes out on the other end. You have to time it whether and then hit it with the hammer at the bottom. So for, for me, like th those little games and then the, the, the sporting days at school for me, that's that's what King's Day is. Uh, it's it's those such a wide range of activities. Yeah, yeah. My, my memories of King's Day. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, Wendy, how about you? Well, the games haven't changed. <laughs> <I missed. laughs> What's reassuring? <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that you also do was uh, cook happen, which is like ah, uh, yes. uh, the, I saw that uh, ontbijt cook, you know, like the sticky uh, um, gingerbread uh, stuff, gingerbread kind of thing, uh, mm. and that's hung a, a cord, and you have you're blindfolded and your hands <laughs> tied around your back, and then you have to you know like bite it off from the from the court but anyway that's that's the kind of stuff quick, that, quick, um, quick that i also yeah do you know where it came from where that comes from wendy because i have no clue but do you know where that comes from why we do that no but that's an interesting thing i'll, I'll have a look into that and I'll, okay. I'll i'll let you know when i find it but i it, it must it must be something typical and it must come from somewhere mm -hmm. but i don't know um, as for, you know, you normally it's just enjoying the day off and um, on, a, on a normal day, non-corona year kind of a Queen's Day or King's Day, I would go to the flea market, uh, but usually they're so crowded now these days mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I usually refrain from going or I go later in the afternoon but still you know it's something which is which draws a lot of people which is good because mm -hmm. then at least the people sell i've never come around because i'm from the hague uh and i i you know each year i kind of think okay especially when the children were little uh we're gonna do it this year but then the the weather forecast was really bad or it was cold or raining because you have to lie out all night in order to get a good spot so you know oh wow <laughs> Who knew? Of, Who knew there was such of, competition? Yeah, well, here at the Frederick Henry Land, it's just, you know... I people, saw that one year. Yeah, yeah. so it's, you have to spend the whole night there. And so, so oh. I never I never bothered doing that. And this year, I'm actually working. Uh, I'm giving a lecture on the uh, Oranje Zaal, which is one of the highlights of House Den Bosch, um, which is, of course, uh, a royal palace here, uh, just on the outskirts of The, of the Hague. Right. Well, I think and it's how about time yourself? Really fascinating. Uh, I'm going to wander around and see see what I can find, Wendy. I have to say, but I think from a, from an expat perspective, I think we tend to associate normally we associate King's Day or, or Queen's Day more with King's Night. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. certainly, when I first got to the Netherlands, it was more about going out the the night, the night before. before. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the, I, th I think for many expats that, that that is how they see it. And, and the flea markets and the games, I think, are perhaps less less well known um, mm -hmm. if, if you're not a, if you're not a native Dutch. Yeah. So, so I think for all of our listeners, whichever of these three options that have been presented sounds the most appealing to you is as they are all available, whether you'd like to go drinking on King's Night uh, visit and join Wendy for an art tour of the Oranje Zaal or uh, join me in the flea markets and the games. Uh, <laughs> each of the options are available uh, on King's Day. Um, and I think we're, we're slowly rounding up. And with that, I think we want to thank uh, you, Wendy, for a, a fascinating conversation about both art and King's Day. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And that if people want to know more about uh, your work, they can find that, of course, on your website, uh, the tours that you do and organize at uh, www.casadelarte.nl. Yeah, um, And we'll right. also, yeah, we'll also post that in the, the, the show notes for people to find there. Okay, thanks for having me. 
Thank you for joining us, Wendy. And for our audience, please stay tuned for uh, another episode at the same time next week. And also remember, of course, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Anchor, and now, as we said, YouTube. So, and again, I'll just reiterate what Tom said. If you do want to see some of those visuals that Wendy described for us, uh, take a look at the YouTube channel and you'll see them all there. Fantastic. And one last addition, we are still ongoing with the uh, giveaways. So there's still some oh, yes. giveaways going on. We have a giveaway with uh, from the Half So Honing from a few time, and we'll have one as well from an episode we're doing next week. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we look forward to having you back on the show. Stay tuned and have a great King's Day. <laughs>